everyone, and welcome to CSIS. Uh, I really want to thank uh, and welcome our Nigerian visitors today. And on behalf of the American people, I, I apologize for the polar, polar vortex that we're experiencing right now. I know it's quite a shock. Um, before we begin, I would like to just pause a moment uh, to remember uh, our friend and colleague, Joel Barkin, uh, who passed away earlier this month. Uh, Joel was a senior associate uh, with the Africa program. He was a world-renowned scholar on African political development. Uh, he was generous, tireless, and a gregarious spirit uh, who will be deeply missed uh, by so many of us here. Uh, his specialty was East Africa, but he spent much of November traipsing around Nigeria uh, with Peter Lewis and loving every moment of it. Um, I really wish that he was here today. So uh, this event marks the launch of the CSIS Nigeria Election Forum, a series of events that we'll be holding over the course of the next 18 months in the run-up and aftermath of Nigeria's forthcoming national elections, currently scheduled or just scheduled for February 14th, 2015. Uh, we're very grateful to the Ford Foundation uh, for the generous support that has made the forum possible, and to the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, SICE, Peter Lewis, and uh, Bob, uh, uh, Paul Lubeck <laughs> um, for partnering with us on this, on this forum. Also, I, to the many colleagues and Nigeria watchers here in Washington who have been generous with their time uh, and insights and helping us shape this, for, this series uh, going forward as well. Uh, the list is long, but among them are Chris Famunio from NDI, Sarah Prey at Open Society Foundations, Johnny, Carsons and John, uh, Johnny Carson and John Temin at USIP, Deirdre Lapin, Gretchen Burkle at IRI. I think there are many more here, and if we haven't got to you yet, uh, we will certainly will in the course of the, the series. I'm looking at John Payton and, and John Campbell here in the front row. Um, and, uh, and so we hope that this will be actually a very collaborative effort here in Washington to help raise the profile of these elections. The forum uh, is intended, again, to kind of showcase uh, the importance uh, and, uh, of these upcoming elections and profile the perspectives of a diverse range of Nigerian opinion leaders, activists, political and party leaders, and government officials uh, around the challenges that are, are facing us in the year ahead. We hope also to identify the priority steps in ensuring that the 2015 elections are free, fair, and credible in the eyes of the Nigerian people, and to better understand where U.S. assistance and diplomatic engagement, whether public or private, can be most effective and helpful. Elections, obviously, are not the be-all and end-all of the democratic process, but they are critically important moments for the political leaders to be held to account and for citizens to shape the country's future. But also, as competing visions of the future crystallize, elections can also be moments that lay bare and sometimes deepen existing fissures, political, regional, religious, ethnic, and, and so forth. And they too often serve as triggers of uncertainty, insecurity, and sometimes violence. In Nigeria, these forthcoming elections are critically important Nigeria is in a period of political flux. Political alliances are shifting as fractures within the ruling PDP have opened, opposition parties coming together to form um, a, a coalition, the All Progressive Congress. Elite consensus around the rules of succession is beginning to unravel. Uh, and the tensions that were manifest in the, in the 2011 elections, which left 800 people dead in their aftermath, many are still unresolved. The possibilities of attacks from the violent extremist group Boko Haram in the north or from militias in the country's oil-producing Niger Delta compound this challenge. So it's in this context of uncertainty and change that the quality, the integrity, and the credibility of the elections have profound implications and the potential of deepening divisions or beginning to bridge them. At this launch event, we have a really exceptional panel. Uh, Professor Atahiru Jega, Chair of Nigeria's Independent National Election Commission, INEX, has joined us, 
and a, a stellar group of civil society leaders um, who are engaged in the electoral process, in civic education, in human rights, and so forth. And we'll, after this, after uh, Professor Jaga's remarks, we're going to turn to a panel um, who the, my colleague Richard Downey uh, will chair. Before I briefly introduce uh, Professor Jaga, I wanted to turn to um, Hillary Pennington, who's Vice President at Ford Foundation, just to say a few words, and again, we're, we're really most grateful for Ford's support. Thanks, Jennifer, and good morning to all of you. I, I am here uh, really representing uh, Innocent Chakuma, who leads our Nigerian West African office. Uh, but I'm very, very um, much looking forward to your discussions here. You know, just as Jennifer just said, I think um, if, if there is anything that observers and stakeholders inside and outside of Nigeria are in agreement about, about the forthcoming general elections, it is that they have the potential to define the stability and future direction of the country. Attention so far has focused on the challenges, uh, especially the volatile security environment, deep-rooted ethnic and religious divisions in the Nigerian society, and the virulent rhetoric of leading political figures which feeds the tension. But for us at the Ford Foundation, the elections present a unique opportunity that has not always been there in the recent history of Nigeria. The possibility of having evenly and keenly contested elections between political parties of fairly equal standing, given the coming together of key opposition parties under one umbrella, and the defection of key figures from the ruling party to the opposition. But this opportunity also presents a different kind of challenge that underscores the importance of this gathering today, which is that the outcome of the elections and its acceptability by all stakeholders will depend heavily on public perception of how effective, efficient, and in particular neutral the electoral admi administration and other critical players will be in performing their functions before, during, and after the election. And we are therefore happy that these series of convenings around the elections are kicking off with a conversation with the chairman of the Nigerian National Independent Electoral Commission, INEC, Professor Atahiru Jaga, and leading civil society actors in the country to get their perspectives on what is going on and what needs to be done. In supporting this convening and the others that will follow under the rubric of the Nigeria Elections Forums, our hope uh, at the Ford Foundation in sponsoring them is, is really threefold. First, that stakeholders, particularly those from Nigeria, will take advantage of them to have candid discussions and come up with suggestions and plans for action that can help advance the conduct of peaceful and credible elections in 2015. Second, that U.S. policymakers, and in particular, the Africa policy community, will be exposed to the major issues at play in the run-up to the elections, be sensitized about the critical importance uh, of the elections to the, to the West African region, and more importantly, pay closer attention to key developments in this complicated time in Nigeria. And finally, we hope that participants will, have balanced, will get balanced information about political developments in Nigeria and can contribute to dispelling the gloom and doom that sometimes pervade discussions about Nigeria these days. So we want to thank CSIS for organizing this meeting, and we look forward to a, to a good discussion and continuing to partner with you going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hillary. Um, now I will turn to Professor Jaga, uh, who is at the chair. Um, you have his biography in your handout, so I'm not going to go over that in detail. Just to say that Professor Jaga was appointed by uh, President Goodluck Jonathan in 2010 and steered the country through the 2011 elections. Those elections were not without flaws, but in technical terms, they were head and shoulders ab ab above the two preceding elections. And much of that is thanks to the leadership of Professor Jaga, whose integrity and credibility candor, openness to communication, and to criticism made that possible. Uh, Professors Jaga, uh, Professor Jaga's leadership showed that individuals can make a tremendous difference in shaping the credibility and restoring confidence in state institutions. Uh, he has a very tough road ahead, but he also has many supporters who are very eager to see this process 
succeed. So Professor Jaga, I'll turn over to you. Welcome, um, and the floor is yours. Distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning to you all. I'm delighted with this opportunity to participate in this event of the CSIS Nigeria Forum. And uh, I thank uh, CSIS, uh, Jennifer, and all the wonderful people at CSIS for giving me this opportunity and some of us from Nigeria to share with you what we've been doing in order to keep on improving the integrity of the conduct of elections in our country. Um, we did our best before the 2011 general elections and the little that we did uh, raised expectations and also uh, generated appreciation uh, to the fact that compared to the previous elections, um, there has been value added and there have been useful reforms, uh, even though the elections were not perfect. Since the 2011 elections, we in the Independent National Electoral Commission preoccupied ourselves with the challenge of bringing additional reforms uh, so that 2015 elections will be remarkably much, much better and so that we can lay the foundation of more sustainable, uh, credible electoral processes in our country beyond uh, 2015. Uh, before I share with you some of the challenges, some of what we've been doing in preparing for the 2015 elections and some of the challenges we've been facing, uh, I, I want, by way of introduction, just make a few uh, remarks. First, I want to say that, and I think virtually all of us in this room know that Nigeria is a country in transition to democracy, that we are still nurturing a democratic political culture after many years of military rule and the anti-democratic tendencies which have been fostered uh, during that period of military rule. Our electoral system is therefore work in progress. The main task is to implement reform measures aimed at incremental positive changes that are sustainable. Democratization in all societies is neither swift nor smooth sailing. It is a long and tortuous process that takes place in incremental waves. Until 1999, Nigeria's experience with democratization was in fits and starts, characterized by military interventions. The Fourth Republic, which is said to have commenced in 1999, has brought some stability to the democratization process. However, the process has been bedeviled by badly conducted elections that left many Nigerians frustrated and questioning the value and the validity of electoral democracy. That was the challenge facing our country when we came on board as a new electoral commission in June 2010. Soon thereafter, we conducted the 2011 elections that were adjudged locally and I think internationally among the best elections Nigeria has ever had. What did the commission do to raise the bar? Let me briefly highlight some of the things that we did before the 2015 general elections so that we can see also what we have done since the 2015 general elections. First of all, we believed that the credibility of the voters register is very, very important to the credibility of the elect elect electoral process. So we committed ourselves to uh, doing a biometric voters register and uh, we were able to do one. Um, since the 2011 elections, we've kept on improving the integrity of that register. We rushed the process of 
doing the register because we used a period of barely three weeks to register and capture biometric details of 73.5 million Nigerians. So there are many challenges in that registration. In fact, one of the key challenges was that because we finished the registration in February and we had to uh, issue a register in accordance with the Electoral Act 30 days before the election, which was by, 30, by 30th of May, because the elections were scheduled in, for April, um, we had to rush the process. So we allowed, uh, even though there should be no two registers for the election, we allowed what we called an addendum register leading to the 2011 elections. We used the electronic register where a sub substantial overwhelming majority of those uh, uh, registered were on that, but then we used what we call addendum register, which was a manual register that contained the details of all those who presented themselves at the registration venues and were registered and were issued what was called a temporary voter's card, but who for technical reasons, either theft of equipment during registration, and there were many, or uh, equipment failure and loss of data, were not eventually on the electronic register. So we allowed that manual register, we called addendum register for the purposes uh, of the general elections in 2011. Uh, and Although we commenced consolidation of, and uh, 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 improving upon the register soon after the 2011 general elections, um, many of the governorship elections we did subsequently, we also had to allow the use of the addendum register. Uh, subsequently, we took a decision that from the Anambra elections and to 2015 and beyond, there will no longer be the use of addendum register, that we would make sure that the biometric register created was optimized, you know, and that subsequent continuous voter registration processes will keep on uh, uh, improving the register. So we did a biometric registration, which we believe has been generally successful, even though there are challenges, some of which we saw during the Anambra elections. Then we introduced what we called a remodified open ballot system. Uh, it was a balloting system that was tried in Nigeria before in 20, during the 1992 elections. But what we did in order to deal with some of the key challenges associated with elections in Nigeria, particularly fraud on election day, uh, multiple voting, multiple uh, registration, movement of uh, people from one voting unit to, to another, uh, we decided to uh, have the process of accreditation and then the process of voting. You know, those who observed the election saw it. It was a cumbersome uh, uh, procedure, a lot of time wasted, but it helped us to deal with that major problem in Nigerian elections when politicians move people from one polling unit to the other uh, on election day. Uh, then, thirdly, we improved election security uh, as best as possible, particularly by improving some of the security features of sensitive electoral materials. These are standard things, normal things in many democracies, but which were lacking in our own context, but which we then ensured that were introduced. For example, serial numbering of ballot papers, color coding of the ballot papers, uh, result sheets with uh, security features, uh, color coding or serial numbering of ballot boxes. All these we introduced, which were lacking uh, before. Then we also revised the framework for engaging ad hoc staff for election duties. In general, volunteers are used uh, globally. Uh, uh, in Nigeria, we had serious challenges about either using volunteers or using uh, hired government public officials. And luckily for us, there is the National Youth Service Corps scheme in Nigeria, where in any given year, there are no less than 350,000 uh, young men and women who have graduated from tertiary institutions and who are doing a one-year national service. So we entered into an agreement with the National Youth Service uh, scheme, and we involved 
the NYSC members as ad hoc uh, uh, election duty staff with little compensation uh, for their services. And those young men and women, as many observers uh, uh, of the 2011 general elections have noted, uh, did their job you know, with passion, with commitment, and with uh, uh, integrity, and it added a lot of value uh, to the process. Uh, then we also ensured that there is, more trans there is greater transparency uh, in the framework for results collation and the announcement of results. And here, uh, we involved previously staff of INEC who are used as returning officers. And uh, when we came in as a new commission, there were allegations about how INEC staff sold results to the highest uh, bidder. And we felt that even if that was just a perception, we needed to do something uh, to ensure that we deal with that perception and also prevent that possibility uh, from occurring. So we brought uh, vice chancellors of federal universities, even state universities, to be returning officers for uh, uh, presidential and governorship elections. And we involved professors and other senior lecturers uh, as returning officers for the lower level elections, senatorial, house of reps, uh, and so on. And uh, it went on very well. And I think there is also a general appreciation of how the involvement of this category of Nigerians has added value and integrity to the electoral process. We also uh, did a lot to bring more open and transparent procedures and modalities uh, on election day. Uh, for example, something again that is given in many electoral jurisdictions, but which was virtually absent in the Nigerian context, was ensuring that result uh, are pasted at the polling unit so that observers and citizens can see who won at any particular uh, polling unit. And we insisted and trained our staff to do that. And uh, for the first time, it was done uh, broadly and more generally. Even though there were still, I think, at the end of it, perhaps only about 70 to 80 polling units uh, displayed the results during the presidential election, but it was there was substantial compliance and it was tremendous uh, value added. We did quite a number of other things, including the creation of what we call an interagency consultative committee on election security. Security challenges are enormous, as we are all uh, aware. Uh, and leading to the 2011 elections, we set up this committee that brought together all security, heads of all security agencies, all their representatives, and it was co-chaired at the national level by the National Security Advisor and the Chairman of INEC. And uh, it offered us an opportunity to discuss all matters relating to security uh, 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 for electoral purposes. And also, uh, it helped us to build synergy and to smoothen inter-service rivalries as they occur in the field with regards to election duty. And it helped a lot really in terms of the preparations for the election. Uh, I think uh, pre-election and election day uh, violence was remarkably reduced, even though there was subsequently the unfortunate incidence of post-election violence, which also taught us a lot of lesson, and we factored it into our preparations uh, for the 2015 uh, general elections. So what lessons did we learn? I think uh, in order to draw the appropriate lessons, we did in-house reviews. We also had security review by the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security. We also had external independent review by uh, uh, people drawn from the academia and the civil society organizations. And then we also did a structural and organizational review, getting uh, notable uh, 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 management consulting firm to advise us about how can we trim INEC, reorganize it, restructure it, so that it can be a trim organization without overlaps of responsibilities so that we can bring additional efficiency and effectiveness into the work of the commission. So all these reviews uh, 
brought out a number of lessons for us uh, for preparing for 2015. And we've been busy uh, uh, trying to implement programs of activities leading to 2015, taking into account those lessons uh, which we've learned. I can mention just a few of these. I think eventually my presentation will be circulated for people to see the details. For example, we we, we, the major, one major lesson we learned was that good elections require adequate and timely planning. And we didn't have adequate time to plan before the 2011 elections. And we realized that going to the 2015 elections, we had to start planning soon after. And we, we've been doing quite uh, a lot of that. We also uh, learned that good elections are about effective partnerships and cooperation because everybody has a role and a responsibility to play. Yes, the election management body has a role to conduct and manage elections efficiently, freely and fairly, you know, but the success of an election being free or fair also depends on how other actors and other stakeholders uh, are involved in the process. And, uh, Improving partnerships and strengthening relationships and cooperation was a big lesson, and we have been busy uh, trying to do that. Also, good elections are about openness. The little we've done to bring transparency to the process showed us how that is appreciated, and they need to be more open and more transparent as we prepare for the 2015 uh, elections. And uh, we also came away with the lesson that even though the election we conducted in 2011 was generally acclaimed as technically one, one of the best, if not the best elections conducted in Nigeria, but we realized that it, we knew from all the reviews that it wasn't a perfect election. There were a lot of challenges and there is also tremendous scope for improvement as we move towards 2015 and we applied ourselves uh, to doing that. So as we prepared for the 2015 general elections, we identified what we call three focal points relating to structure, to policy, and to plan. With regards to structure, we've taken a long and uh, a, a deep look at INEC as an institution, its structure and processes, as well as its human resources. With regards to policy, we have focused on developing new policies to guide our work and create the right normative framework for successful election management in Nigeria, not just in 2015, but beyond 2015. And with regards to planning, we have focused on both strategic planning and election day planning, which we believe are also very, very important uh, for success. Uh, in the last 18 months or so, we've done quite a lot uh, in regards to all uh, these uh, focal points which I have identified. Uh, again, my presentation has in detail itemized what we've done. I'll just give a few examples. For example, we did a strategic plan uh, covering the period 2012 to 2016, and we've been busy implementing it. There are still challenges, but I think we've come far, and we believe that the way we've implemented it has added value uh, which uh, would impact the conduct of the elections in 2015. Um, we also did a detailed what we call an election project plan, which tells us what we needed to do, you know, leading to the 2015 uh, uh, election. And uh, we, as I have mentioned earlier on, did a comprehensive reorganization and restructuring of the commission based on the report of the uh, uh, management consulting firm, which we engaged. Um, I would not also bother to mention the specific uh, uh, things which the restructuring was designed to achieve. I have itemized them uh, here. But I think what is most important is that it has helped us to do what I call putting square pegs in square hole within uh, the context of the resources, human resources that INEC has. It has also helped us in terms of identifying training gaps and training needs and uh, getting many of our development partners to assist in terms of uh, uh, bridging uh, those identified uh, gaps. 
And then, of course, we have done a lot of the consolidation and deduplication of the biometric uh, register, uh, even though, as I mentioned, uh, we, we believe very strongly that in spite of what you often read in the press, you know, the register of voters we have in Nigeria, you know, can compare favorably with any similar register, electronic biometric register on the African continent. Uh, we have no doubt uh, about that. But it's not a perfect register, it's a work in progress. You know, we are using EFIS to remove multiple registration and we've successfully removed multiple registration, but we also know that the EFIS uh, uh, is, is, is not 100% uh, optimal, you know, it can remove, but there are, uh, sometimes it's not 100%, but if you achieve 98%, uh, 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 it's good enough to keep on uh, improving upon. Um, one area which was very challenging for us was the area of uh, voter education and publicity. And um, we've done our best before 2011. We realized there's a lot more to be done in 20, leading to 2015. And uh, we have just approved what we call a communication policy and strategy, which gives us a good framework in terms of how to communicate more effectively uh, leading to the 2015 general uh, elections with identified roles and target groups and what strategies can be used uh, to reach those uh, target uh, groups. Um, so in... Uh, We are convinced that the prospects of having remarkably much better elections in 2015 are bright, given what we've been able to do to reform and to improve the process since the 2011 elections, things that we were not able to do before the 2011 elections. And we believe that this should add tremendous value uh, uh, to uh, making 2015 elections free, fair, peaceful, and credible. But of course, there are still a number of challenges uh, outstanding. Uh, there is the challenge of insecurity, which uh, I think is generally known. And some of these are systemic challenges. There is little, if anything, that an electoral commission can do about it. But uh, I can tell you that as far as we are concerned in INEC, we are preparing in the belief that elections will take place everywhere all over the country in 2015, you know, and uh, our hope is that uh, long before 2015, given the many efforts that are being made uh, to bring peace, uh, whether it is uh, with regards to the security agencies or with regards to dialogue and uh, reaching out, we hope that sufficient uh, stability would be restored in many of these areas where there is emergency for us to be able to do elections without any fear for the staff that we deploy on election duty or for the materials that we would deploy on election duty. We have to be incurable optimists to, to operate in the kind of atmosphere in which we operate. And, uh, and I, I think many Nigerians, many Nigerians would want to see elections take place all over the country. And uh, so, as I say, we prepare, you know, in the belief that elections will take place uh, all over the country. Funding is a challenge. In our country, where matters are, in, where money is involved, everybody is suspect. So when we do election budget and we present it, everybody thinks that ha, they have padded up the budget, uh, even though we know that in comparative terms in Africa, our election budget using the key indicator of um, uh, measuring uh, election budgets, it's, it's comparable to all budgets of elections in the African continent. Of course, Nigeria has the disadvantage of size. You know, we are huge. I mean, a very large country in terms of terrain, you know, population. Uh, uh, so it will require a lot of resources. So it's a challenge trying to defend the budget for elections. 
but still we feel confident because in 2011, whatever we requested was provided. And uh, the legal framework is such that, that once our budget is appropriated by the National Assembly, it is released uh, by the executive. So there is relative financial autonomy uh, in that regard. And it, it's, I think perhaps we enjoy better in relative autonomy than any other previous commission with regards to funding. But of course we know again uh, uh, in our own country where budgeting is circumscribed by macroeconomic uh, crises and fluctuations, uh, what you want or need is not actually what you always get. So there is always that apprehension as to whether we'll get the resources that we need. But again, judging by what happened in 2011 and the need to do even better, we think that what we need uh, would be provided. Um, but one major area, of course, of challenge is the attitude of the political class. We've done our best to remove impunity in the process, to minimize, if not eliminate, interference. You know, but again, there are areas that are exclusive jurisdictions of political parties and candidates uh, by law. Uh, and there is very little we can do in that regard. And looking at those areas, uh, there is a lot of cause for concern. Uh, for example, we are still, there is still much to be desired with regards to civility in the conduct of politicking by our uh, politicians. You know, uh, sometimes uh, statements made by politicians or candidates are not really state manly. Is it or statesman? Is that the word? Or statesmanship? Whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, and and the utterances, you know, uh, tend to overheat the atmosphere and to generate conflict rather than create a framework for stability and so on. So this is a very serious matter of concern. And we also know that the mindset with which politicians uh, come into the political arena uh, is what in Nigeria is called the do or die mentality, you know, winning by hook uh, or by crook. We've succeeded in moderating that. We've got all the political parties to commit themselves to a code of conduct. We did that before the 20, 2007 elections. We've done that now, long before the 2011 elections. But you know, a code of conduct is a freely signed agreement. There are little, if any, sanctions. It's all a matter of uh, trust and the disposition and the attitude of the politicians who have signed this code of conduct. So our hope is to work together with many civil society, non-governmental organizations uh, to keep on uh, pushing for the need for political parties to respect the code of conduct, to bring civility into discourse, political discourses, to focus on uh, 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 manifestos and uh, agenda and programs rather than uh, personality uh, and uh, uh, insults and, and those kinds of things. The other challenge is that we also have in general, an apathetic and indifferent uh, citizenry, very inactive. If you look at the statistics of participation uh, in 2011, uh, I think uh, the highest percentage was with regards to the presidential election and it was barely 57% or, or thereabout. In Anambra election, which we did recently, uh, participation rate was 26%. Uh, or thereabouts. Uh, although, if you compare it with participation rate in the previous elections, uh, the the last governorship, the previous governorship election in Anambra State, for example, had barely 17% participation level. You know, the one we conducted recently had 26%. But there is still a lot of talk about disenfranchisement that we have disenfranchised people and and so on. And really, the whole talk about dis disenfranchisement was media hype by those who lost the election in Anambra State and uh, who wanted to capitalize on the few mistakes that had been made uh, in order to have the entire results uh, canceled. Uh, 
all talk about disenfranchisement was about people who were on the addendum register and whom we said will not vote uh, in the election and whom we gave an opportunity as far back as August to use the continuous registration platform to have their details recaptured onto the electronic uh, register. You know, and we did our best with limitations of resources to do voter education to get people to come out uh, and so on. We even did a display of the register and I required all those who did not see them, their names on the displayed register to know that they need to use the opportunity of the CVR so that their details will be uh, recaptured. Uh, evidently, many people did not use that uh, opportunity. Uh, and of course, since we didn't use the addendum registers, if you came to a polling unit and uh, your name is not on the register, then you are not allowed to vote. And uh, because many of these people had the temporary voters card issued in 2011, then what you see is they flash the card. We have the card, yet our name is not in the register and a lot of media hype was done. Again, one weakness of our communication strategy was that you know, we did not respond efficiently and quickly and until the damage was, was done. And it's a big lesson we've learned from Anambra uh, moving forward. Um, and then, of course, there were many people who did multiple registration and whose names have been removed uh, from the register. Our business rule was that if a person does more than one registration, we eliminate the last registration that has been done. No, no we em eliminate the previous registrations and leave the last registration that has been done. You know, so if somebody registered in a particular place initially and went and registered again, and by our business rule, we removed him from the first place where he has registered, and during election now, he comes to that place, of course, he would not see his name on the register. Now, the lesson we've learned from Anambra is that as we move towards 2015, in all of these elections we are going to do in Ekiti and in uh, uh, Oshun State this year, we intend to also publish the names of those who have done multiple registration. If you come to a polling unit, your name, your name is not on the register, it's because you've done multiple registration, and this is where your name uh, is. It's like bending over backwards to ac accommodate people who have committed offenses, but at least it will minimize all this hype about uh, uh, disenfranchising uh, people. Uh, another challenge is with regards to the amendment to the legal framework. The Electoral Act 2010 is very good, much, much better than previous legal framework for the election. But from our experience in 2011, there are still areas that need to be uh, reviewed. And we've made submissions to the uh, uh, National Assembly. We are concerned that it has taken this long, uh, but uh, towards the end of December, we had a meeting with the Senate Committee on Electoral Matters, and we've received assurances that before June, the electoral legal framework would be improved upon. And we hope and pray that that happens, because certainly then it will give us a better legal framework, much more improved legal framework for the conduct of elections. We are not hopeful that constitutional amendment may come through before that period, because there are certain recommendations that we made also to constitutional amendments which have bearing on the electoral legal framework. But if all we can get is a review of the Electoral Act, I think uh, it will add substantial value in terms of the integrity of the legal framework before the 2015 elections. We've drawn the attention of the legislators that Nigeria is a signatory to many international protocols that uh, uh, advised that uh, legal reforms should not come into effect uh, earlier than 60 days before uh, an election. ECOWAS protocol, AU protocol, Commonwealth protocol. So, so we hope that will really catalyze or hasten the process of a review uh, well before June. Um, now, we committed ourselves to 
reviewing electoral constituencies and to creating new polling units. We've commenced the process. We had an elaborate program. Uh, regrettably, as we all know, reviewing constituencies is a very controversial political matter. And the signals we've been getting, we ourselves, particularly because of inadequacy and the inaccuracy of data, particularly the population data to be able to, because population criteria is major uh, in our context, even though there are other variables for that. Um, but the signals we are getting is that really to achieve a comprehensive constituency delimitation uh, uh, would be virtually impossible between now and the 2015 elections. And so we are scaling down our priority. We are doing a lot with regards to mapping you know, mapping existing constituencies, because there are even no maps for existing uh, constituencies using satellite imagery and uh, 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 GI, uh, GIS and, and other uh, ICT uh, fora, uh, I mean, uh, resources. So we, we are doing a lot with regards to that. So here, this is one key thing that we have wanted to do before the 2015 general elections, which we are likely to do to successfully uh, have new constituencies delimited, passed with a resolution of the National Assembly, because it's a requirement. In some jurisdictions, once the Electoral Commission redraws boundaries, uh, they don't need or require a passage by the legislature. Uh, in some jurisdictions, you submit to the legislature, but there is a time frame. If they do not pass it into law, then it becomes effective. But in our jurisdiction, that is a requirement. There has to be a resolution of the two houses uh, before uh, new constituencies come into effect. But what we hope to achieve at the minimum uh, is the creation of additional polling units. Uh, right now, uh, many of our polling units are so large and therefore very difficult to manage. And uh, we are aiming at a minimum of 500 registered voters per constituency. Uh, and uh, if we are able to do that, it will also bring uh, the operational election day activities to uh, uh, you know, re reasonably acceptable international uh, standards. Um, then prosecution of electoral offenders has been a major uh, challenge for us. We've made commitments, the law, says that INEC has the responsibility to prosecute electoral offenders, not the police, but INEC. But in prosecuting, we have to rely on police investigation reports and we have to rely on uh, uh, the courts and their traditional ways of operating. So there is a lot we can do. We are committed to continue to prosecute electoral offenders leading to the 2015 election. We are forging partnerships, uh, particularly with the Bar Association. Uh, we have so far prosecuted only about 200, which is a record because where we came from, there was no record of successful prosecution, uh, but, uh, but it's a drop in the ocean, as I often say, given the uh, number of electoral offenders. Um, so there are a lot of things that we've done that gives us optimism that uh, 2015 will be much, much better than uh, 2011. Of course, there are still a lot of skeptics out there. We still make mistakes, which then give people grounds to uh, further uh, uh, reject the notion that we have the competence and the capacity to do better. Uh, in 2015, but we remain focused, we remain determined, and we continue to do our best as we move towards 2015. So the assurance I will give you here is that from an assessment of our preparations, 2015 general elections uh, uh, will be much, much better than 2011. We will continue to raise the bar substantially from where we left it in 2011. And uh, given what I said in my opening remarks, increased uh, sustained reform efforts and actions are really what will lead us to democratic consolidation, deepening democracy in our country, and ensuring 
a robust and sustainable uh, electoral uh, framework. But I must say that while we do all we've been doing, we also know that our own effort enough is not enough. You know, all stakeholders have a role to play. And when you hear people speak in the media or some politicians speak, it is as if it is only INEC that can make elections in 2015 free, fair, and credible. Everybody has a role, the politicians, the parties, the civil society organizations, the different uh, stakeholders. And we are doing our best to sensitize all stakeholders to this and to get everybody and to put all hands on deck uh, for that. And we believe that in 2015, God willing, Nigeria will take its rightful place in the Global Committee of Nations where electoral democracy is being consolidated. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Jaga. And uh, for uh, the audience here, we will post those remarks on our website to, to go along with the webcast here so you can uh, look at the, the finer details. Although that was a very rich and, and detailed um, a description of all that Dynek has been doing. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm gonna just take a few questions. I'll take them together and we'll turn back to um, Professor Jaga. Uh, this may mean that our following panel goes over a little bit. I hope you can bear with us um, in that. Um, but let's take some questions. Um, the gentleman there, and then we'll come over here. Thank you. <coughs> uh, thank you, Professor Jiga, for your uh, brilliant presentation here. Uh, my name is uh, Samuel Okim Bono. I'm the uh, executive director of the Nigerian American Leadership Council, located right here in Washington, D.C. And as um, a policy advisory uh, institution for United States uh, government regarding Nigeria, American matters and Nigerian matters, uh, we, we like to uh, pride ourselves in trying to offer solutions and not just criticizing from the uh, bench. And so um, as much as your presentation has captured some of the questions that we had today, but we'd like to also uh, provide uh, an advisory that perhaps INEC needs to uh, install security cameras within the polling centers, especially uh, while the results are being collated. Uh, because um, we all know that uh, there's just this um, potential that's always out there for uh, either INEX staff or anybody else to try to compromise the votes after they're already cast. Thank you. Uh, okay. We're, we're going to have to keep the questions fairly short, I'm afraid. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, and just for both in. And, and then also, uh, we, we don't know if there's a policy that ensures that uh, INEX staff that handle sensitive materials sign a asset, an asset disclosure form, and also uh, an asset disclosure form that can be revisited five years after the election. That way, if there's any kind of a compromise uh, that has happened, it can be captured and uh, during prosecution. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, on the left. No, uh, this place. Our Hi, old intern. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Jennifer. Professor Jega, thank you for the great presentation. You mentioned briefly during your talk that uh, you reach out to the National Youth Service for them to volunteer. I would like to know what else is being done to make sure that young people are fully participating in the electoral system. Thank you. Thank you. And then one over here, um, <laughs> over on the far left. Hi, uh, Professor Jega. Thanks for your presentation. Um, you mentioned briefly about the media. Um, I'm wondering, what is INEC doing with regards to Nigerian media? If you look at the last election in Ghana, their media played a critical role in helping to quiet things down. 
You know, then we are calling out politicians that we are making inflammatory remarks. So it was quite remarkable. I saw, I was watching live on uh, Joy FM. So I'm thinking if Ghana could do this, do, uh, 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 play that role, can Nigerian media do the same? Can, what role does INEC I, I play in training Nigerian media that they have a critical role to play in next year's election? Thank you. Thank you very much. These are great questions and, and may actually be subject of, of future forums. I mean, we've been thinking of having one, particularly on that, on the role of the media. Yes, Ambassador. Uh, uh, microphone's coming. Hello, uh, Chairman Yeager. It's good to see you. I wanted to ask about the reports about the timetable of the election being moved up to the end of 2014 and uh, whether or not also the timetable of the governorship would be after the presidency. And if any of that is true, then would like to have your comments as to what the thinking is to do that. Um, thank you very much. Uh, these are very uh, uh, good and interesting questions. Well, um, in 20, with regards to security cameras and improving security uh, in the polling units, uh, in 2011, um, we, on an experimental basis, bought some recording devices, uh, cameras that could be used. Uh, for, for that purpose, but, but really the bottom line is that these are cost elements in the election budget, you know, and uh, there, are, there are areas, I mean, in Nigeria, if you have to deploy a camera, video camera in every polling unit, it's, it's going to be very costly. Uh, but what we have succeeded in doing in all the elections we've conducted so far is to ensure that collation centers where results of the elections are coll collated are video recorded, uh, whether they are at the local government level uh, or uh, at the state level or at the presidential uh, collation center. But to take that down to the polling units is a huge cost element that we can't afford in the budget. But these are areas that perhaps support can, can come for. Um, now, do staff sign asset disclosure forms? No, I don't know, but it, in the sense that all materials distributed, there is a paper trail, you know, who gives them out, who collected them, in what quantities, and that paper trail is there, and it can be reviewed, you know. So, so really, uh, there is documentation in that regard, although I do not understand. So to this extent, yes. You know, but I don't know whether you have some suggestions specifically about how this can be done better. Now, uh, National Assembly and uh, what is being done about young people's participation. Um, obviously, we in INEC have recognized uh, the very good and important role that young uh, people can play in the electoral process. And in some of our partnerships with civil society organizations, uh, we seek to explore those areas and to sensitize and to involve uh, young people. One of that, the partnerships we've had, which has been very, very useful, is with regards to the use of social media, uh, both by NGOs run and managed by young people, as well as targeting uh, young people. And um, as I speak with you, in addition to our normal public relations department, we have created what we call uh, a citizens uh, inf inf information center, uh, uh, citizens communications uh, uh, center. Uh, we call it ICC, ICCC. You know, <laughs> uh, and and it's been very useful. We use multimedia resources uh, to provide information on a daily basis to all those who have inquired for, for information or clarification and so on. This is in addition to our website, which we keep on trying to, to improve. And uh, uh, 
so, so we, we recognize the very important role of young people. Uh, I don't think there are specific efforts at legislation uh, that seeks to draw uh, the potential of young people, but uh, there are some lawyers here who are paying more attention to those issues than myself who may comment. Now, Nigerian media, compared to Ghanaian media and the positive roles they play, I think you are right. I, I, unfortunately, in Nigeria, I mean, there are many good people out there in the media who are doing their job cred credibly or creditably. But the tendency has been negative, and the tendency has been that of the use, either skillful or crude use of the media by political interests to uh, get what they want the news that they, they favor them rather than the truth and the facts uh, of the case. And what we saw in Anambra is one uh, of those clear illustrations of the ways in which political interests use the media to shape public opinion contrary to the facts on the ground. As I have said, yes, mistakes were made, serious, terrible mistakes by, say, uh, our official, the electoral officer in one of the 21 local governments messed up, I have said it, the distribution of result sheets. We made sure in the past, result sheets were just a pro forma form, which you can take a result sheet from Inugu and take it to Anambra or take it to Sokoto and use it. You know, and we customized result sheets such that you know, a result sheet is always specific to a polling unit. You know, so and so your attention has to be paid to the distribution. If you make a wrong uh, a distribution, then it takes time and energy and effort to retrieve and to redistribute. And we've trained our people and they knew this, and unfortunately in one of the 21 local governments, the distribution was messed up. There was no credible explanation as to why that happened, which was why we have uh, commenced prosecution of the officer involved, you know, and that happened in one local government. Unfortunately, politicians used that local government to make nonsense of the entire elections in the 20 other local governments, you know, and wanted the results to be cancelled because of that. You know, and the Nigerian media, you know, got on, regrettably, and again, it's not their fault, maybe it's also the fault of our own communication strategies. As I said, we were slow in, in responding, and we've learned the bitter lesson from that as we move towards uh, 2015. But you are right, there is a lot that the media can do positively, and we are increasing our engagement with uh, 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 editors and political correspondents. You know, uh, many development partners are also doing uh, workshops and training programs to get them to play a more positive role as we move towards 2015. So we'll continue to do our best under those uh, circumstances. But the media needs to have an enlightened public interest rather than be driven by the particularistic interests of, of politicians. And we see a lot of that, unfortunately. And then just quickly on the timing and we'll... Address. Well, um, <laughs> we issued a timetable for the elections uh, this weekend, this past weekend. We had a retreat uh, in Kaduna where we met with all the key staff of INEC, national commissioners, resident electoral commissioners, directors, and reviewed our preparations towards the 2015 elections. And we've now issued the timetable, both for the governorship elections in Ekiti and Oshun, as well as for the general uh, elections. Um, the law permits INEC to uh, issue the timetable and the sequence of the elections. And uh, what we have done is to decide now, instead of the three elections that we conducted in 2011, we will now conduct two elections in 2015. And we've decided to do all the national elections on one day, and then to do all the local state elections uh, on another day. And uh, uh, we have also fixed the dates early in, in the timetable, the earliest time permissible by law 
For example, the national elections by law are to be conducted no later, no, no, is it? No, no, no later or no earlier. The lawyers have this <laughs> phraseology <laughs> that I don't understand. <laughs> yes, no later than 150 days uh, and no earlier, is it? No, no earlier. earlier than 150 days and no later than 30 days before the election. And, uh, and what we have done is to say, okay, let's do it early enough so that we will allow a bit more time for litigation, hoping that a lot of the cases would be resolved before the handing over date. Uh, so we fixed the election now in February, and uh, the presidential elections together with the National Assembly elections, which is presidential, senatorial, and the House elections will take place on 14th of uh, February, which I've just been told is Valentine's Day or something. <laughs> it's the first thing that came to my mind. <laughs> but, uh, well, I, 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 perhaps that's good, <laughs> yes. Um, and then uh, the governorship and the state House of Assembly elections on the 28th uh, of February. So um, I've been reading the media in the last two days, and it's very interesting. There are some who think it's good. There are others who still think is not good enough. Some people are saying we should have done all the elections on one day. You know, and there's something perhaps that we can aspire to. But when the logistic challenges are so enormous that for now, given the uh, infrastructure, existing infrastructure, we better minimize the challenges. And facing this the elections is probably better for now. And I share an anecdote. I was in a conference with, the, with Ahmed Hassan the chairman of the Kenyan Electoral Commission uh, sometimes last year, and he, after he made a very beautiful presentation, he was asked, if there is anything that you did in this election that given the opportunity you will not do again, what will it be? And he said, conducting all the elections on one day. <laughs> so I quickly cornered him and said, you need to come to Nigeria and tell Nigerians why you know, it's, frankly, it's, it's, it will be very, very challenging for now for us to do all the elections on one day. But what we are trying to do is to keep on trying, you know, uh, and improving. As I said, incremental positive changes, you know, so, which are sustainable, and that's what we are working towards. Professor Jiga, thank you so much uh, for, for that, um, and uh, apologies that we can't take more questions. We're going to turn quickly uh, to the next panel. If everyone could just stay in their seats and the panel will, will come up. Um, again, everyone here I think is, is, uh, wants you to succeed and I think uh, are willing to do what they can from, from here um, to help that happen. So thanks very much, and please join me in Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Downey, also with the Africa program here. Um, and for the second part of our event this morning, uh, we're delighted to be joined by a group of prominent Nigerian civil society leaders who've been working collectively uh, for some time on strategies to improve the conduct of Nigeria's election planning uh, and execution. Uh, they're here in Washington uh, not only to uh, talk uh, to you this morning, but also to meet uh, policymakers from uh, across the U.S. government uh, uh, to make sure that next February's elections are on the radar of policymakers here, and that uh, advanced planning uh, is is uh, well underway. Uh, one lesson that we learned from the 2011 elections was that civil society has uh, a critical role to play in the run-up to, during, and beyond the days of the polling itself. 
uh, in encouraging public participation, in civic education, uh, in holding political candidates and parties uh, to standards of good conduct, uh, in being a calming uh, uh, influence, uh, and in monitoring, of course, the polling uh, itself. Now that role looks, uh, from, from our standpoint here, looking ahead to next year, to be even more important uh, in 2015, given the uh, current political flux and the security environment uh, in parts of the country. Uh, on our panel this morning, we have the heads of some of the most influential uh, civil society groups in Nigeria. Um, also, actually, a, a coincidentally, a triumvirate of lawyers uh, uh, on, the, on the platform this morning. That wasn't deliberate, but um, you have their bios in front of you. I won't waste time going into all the details, but just uh, very briefly, Clement uh, Nwankwo, my immediate right, is the executive uh, director of uh, policy and uh, legal advocacy center. He also uh, uh, hosts and leads uh, the Civil Society Nigeria Election Situation Room. Uh, that's a platform for all the various civil society uh, organizations working on electoral uh, observation. Uh, next to him, Aisha Asori is uh, CEO, CEO of the Nigerian Women's Trust Fund, which is a nonprofit organization working to increase the quality and quantity of women in government. And then uh, to my far right is Festus Okoy, who's a barrister, solicitor of the Supreme Court of Nigeria, uh, also executive director of the NGO Human Rights Monitor, uh, and also the national coordinator of the Independent Election Monitoring Group, along with various other titles uh, and accolades as well. Um, our three panelists are only uh, half of the delegation we have with us here this week. Uh, the, the others, uh, we just don't have a platform big enough here for, for all of them, but the others, perhaps they can stand up uh, and, and just sort of say hello to the audience as well. Um, uh, we have uh, uh, Abiola, Akiode, uh, Alofabi, uh, Afalabi, sorry, I'm mangling names already, who's Executive Director of Women uh, Advocates Research and Documentation Center. Uh, Inemo Samiyama uh, is the country director of the Stakeholders Democracy uh, Network, which works uh, in the Niger Delta. And then Jude uh, Ohanele, who's president of the Southeast Governance Network, uh, which is a coalition of uh, civil society organizations in the Southeast region of Nigeria. And when we get to the q and I'd like to bring them in as much as possible and include them in the conversation as well. But first, I'd like to turn to Clement uh, to make a, a few opening remarks We'll have very brief remarks as well from Aisha and Festus, and then we'll reserve the rest of the time for your questions and answers. Clement. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, first of all, to thank CSIS for organizing this. Uh, it's really, for us, uh, quite encouraging to see the Nigeria elections uh, beginning to take uh, uh, center stage in, in, in policy centers such as uh, Washington, D.C., uh, as well Ford Foundation for supporting this. Um, we really, uh, the chairman of INEC has uh, spoken this morning and uh, he gives us a lot of encouragement looking towards 2015 and only a few days ago announced uh, dates for the 2015 general elections. Uh, the first being February 14th next year. He says he doesn't know why it was fixed for February 14th. Uh, certainly given the tension, given the pressures, given the talk about violence, uh, fixing it on a day that uh, has its own significance for love and peace uh, perhaps means that uh, that's the expectation we all have towards 2015. But certainly the elections in 2015 uh, represents or would represent a milestone for Nigeria's political and democratic development where it to go uh, very successful. And we, we hope it does go very successful. Uh, we in the civil society groups have uh, continued to work in support of um, INEC, uh, not just because uh, INEC is headed by one of our own, uh, but because uh, all of our work has really focused on helping to entrench the development of democracy in Nigeria. Uh, civil society are organized around uh, a lot of fora. Uh, the uh, Civil Society Election Situation Room is one of such, which brings together several uh, Nigerian organizations working in different areas, different uh, uh, focuses to try to achieve cohesion in terms of our interventions with elections. And we have had several of such interventions, engagement with INEC, engagement with the security services, uh, engagement with the actors of state, engagement with the political parties uh, to provide an unbiased 
uh, intervention and, uh, and co coordination with these different stakeholders in the election uh, process. And like I said, uh, suicide groups continue to give support to INEC in what it does. Uh, we must, of course, commend the chairman of INEC for his openness. Uh, uh, this was made, uh, I think, uh, uh, Jennifer in her opening remarks did make those comments. Uh, openness, but also willingness to take criticisms. And we, we've had quite a lot of criticisms for INEC. Uh, the last local council, the last local uh, governorship elections in Anambra that the chairman repeatedly mentioned uh, was one of such uh, important occasions for us to observe the elections and come up with our own criticisms of the challenges that INEC has not really uh, addressed uh, the way we would like it to address it. Uh, and the chairman has mentioned uh, several issues. Uh, increasingly, of course, uh, uh, INEC is uh, showing the potential and perhaps even likelihood of being able to address these issues. Uh, in the last uh, governorship elections, which is only uh, two months away, uh, two months ago, uh, there were criticisms of INEC about its uh, logistics preparations. Uh, we did criticize uh, the voters register. Uh, it, it continues to be a cause for concern for us because of the various um, observations, uh, various complaints about the adequacy of the voters register. We do know that INEC is doing a lot to try to bring it in conformity with acceptable uh, standards and reduce the complaints. And we, we hope that looking towards 2015, that INEC would, as the chairman has stated, address this problem because it, it would be a major uh, concern if this problem was to remain in the 2015 general elections. And we know that there are local governorship elections coming up in June this year in Ekiti and uh, following that Oshun State. Uh, we would be following those elections quite closely to see INEC's uh, preparedness uh, to deal with uh, elections. We also know that there are issues uh, related, and I think there was an intervention about uh, how you can interrogate the fairness and impartiality of INEC officials. We certainly in civil society do have a lot of respect for the chairman of INEC. We can uh, vouch for his integrity, uh, but there are 12 other national commissioners in the electoral commission, and we, we may not be able to say as much for all of them as we can say uh, for the chairman, and yet they are all critical part of the preparations for the elections. And uh, the chairman may be chairman, but he's not a dictatorial chairman, which means that some of these actors also have a say in how the elections are conducted, and sometimes their loyalty, their interests, and who they serve is also uh, a matter of concern for civil society groups, and we're anxious to see that the chairman can exert his own moral authority over some of these national commissioners and get them to be more uh, concerned about delivering free and credible elections just as he is also uh, willing uh, to do. Uh, beyond all of this is really the fact that looking towards 2015, we know that elections will be very contentious. Uh, it is perhaps uh, likely to be one of the most contentious in Nigeria's history. It's an election that as I sit here, and I'm sure as the chairman sits here, not that he makes forecasts, and none of us can tell who can win the elections. In 2011, we could say, yes, there's every probability that the ruling party could win the elections. Today, we may even go as far as saying it is likely that the ruling party may not win the elections. Uh, and that, I think, means that there is uh, going to be an important need for the international community to take greater interest in what happens. Uh, in 2011, the president of the country did make commitments to Nigerians and to the international community that he would not interfere in the independence of the uh, electoral commission and would, not, and would accept whatever results uh, the election uh, body announces. Uh, we, we would like to see the international community make such demands of him as they did in 2011 uh, to ensure that he also makes statements committing to not interfering in the independence of the Electoral Commission because from the civil society point of view, and we know that the INEC chairman cannot say that, but from the uh, civil society point of view, we have observed tendencies towards compromising the independence of the Electoral Commission. Uh, and, and we are, of course, very confident that with the chairman of the commission there, whom we all respect, that this would not be allowed to happen, but he has no control over all of what happens with elections. So we ask the international community to join us from 
the civil society in Nigeria to make demands on President Goodluck Jonathan uh, for him to state very publicly, very categorically, that he would respect the independence and impartiality, uh, uh, the independence of electoral commission and not interfere in its ability to conduct the elections in a free and fair manner. We also would like him to make commitments publicly to accepting whatever results that are announced by the Independent National Electoral Commission as a result of the conduct of elections. There are several other issues. The challenges in the northeast of the country with the uh, Boko Haram uh, remains a very important issue. At this time, there is still in existence, uh, there's a legal questions about that, whether there is a state of emergency in the northeast of the country and the threat or possibility that elections may not happen in the Northeast, of course, these are states that compro uh, comprise about a sixth of Nigeria's electoral population. And if elections were not to happen in the Northeast, it would immediately go to question the uh, full participation or even legitimacy of elections in 2015. So it's important that we keep an eye on that and ensure that um, whatever uh, happens with the elections, that the state of emergency does not operate in such a way as to exclude a significant population of Nigerians from participating in elections. We also have to keep an eye on the security services. As we speak, there has been flashpoints in the Niger Delta region, uh, in the state of Rivers, where the police has a head in that state who has operated like a law unto himself, not subject to the control of the Inspector General of Police, and who has disrupted uh, political activities by the opposition political party in that state, sometimes even shooting at elected officials. And one of the cases was a senator from that state who was shot by the police in the midst of organizing a public uh, rally by the political party, where the law allows for such a party to hold legally, uh, for such a, a, a rally to hold legally. This is a very important issue for us. There's been demands for the redeployment of that police commissioner, but apparently he seems to be working very closely with certain persons who are closely affiliated with the ruling party. And we're very worried about how this would impact on the impartiality uh, of the uh, unfairness of the police in uh, uh, leading towards the elections. Uh, we also have to look at the issue of how the parties conduct their primaries. Uh, this would be an important contentious issue as the political parties, the ruling party, and of course the main opposition party choose their candidates. And we in civil society are, uh, are constantly making the demands and we ask those who are watching Nigeria closely and the international community to make the same demands of the parties that they respect the internal democratic processes leading up to the choice of their candidates. Uh, because this would again impact on the nature of legitimacy of the elections. Uh, I, I would uh, just say one more thing and stop, which is really the support for the work that civil society is doing in Nigeria, that it is important that we get as much support uh, as possible. The dimensions of uh, work that we would need to do in 2015 with elections would really even be greater, and we ask that the international community continues to give us support to be able to achieve the various interventions that we need to do. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Clement. Uh, Aisha, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. And um, thank you to CSIS, Ford Foundation, and obviously the audience for being here. I think between Professor Jega and Clement, you've already set the context properly for the elections. But as a Nigerian who's lived all her life there, I, I can't overstress that our fears as Nigerians for elections are not um, irrational. The history of elections in Nigeria since 1959 has, one, has been one of constantly rigging um, election fraud, violence, the use of security forces. That's our reality. And while INEC will be commended for improving the elections in 2011, the truth still remains that we still have a long way to go, which was pointed out by Jega. So that's the context in which we are preparing for 2015. Um, since the 2011 elections, which were partly marred by first cancellations on the first day of elections because material didn't um, arrive on time. We've still had those issues with um, elections that happened in 2013, um, particularly in Anambra, which is the latest one. So we can see a pattern of recurring issues, um, particularly around materials, um, violence, security issues, 
And that's what is worrying most of Nigerians and worrying myself and my constituencies, which are mainly women and young people. Um, ironically, people will say, including INEC um, officials, that women make up the majority of voters in Nigeria. I think after the cleanup of the register in Anambra, supposedly we had more women registered than men. But at the same time, women are the ones who bear the brunt mostly of the violence, and they're the ones who are most likely to stay away and tell their children who are youth to stay away as well. So getting security right is actually very important. Uh, so in that context, um, for me, there are really three, four key areas of concerns, not to belabor the issue, but the first would be the preparedness of INEC. What can we do to help INEC be more prepared in terms of meeting all its objectives and its timelines and its goals? We've heard Jada talk about the register, the continuous register, um, voters registration going on, cleaning up, publishing the register for voter verification. Um, typically, these things and the timelines given usually get pushed back. How can we ensure that these things keep on track and we can prepare? Again, Jega has pointed out planning is key. How do we help them stay with their plans? Um, he mentioned the legal framework. That cannot be underscored um, enough. We really need to get the Electoral Act approved. These are one of the ways in which um, the elections are um, impacted without the control or um, what's the word I'm looking for? Without the control of INEC, because INEC really can't say what type of timeline NAS will work with. So it's very important for us to put enough pressure on the National Assembly to finish passing the Electoral Act and the Constitution if it's going to have any impact on our electoral framework. Um, we've talked about voter apathy. Again, that's very critical for us. There are two things. First I mentioned was the violence. The second bit is the quality of the candidates. There's a lot that could be done in terms of talking about the candidates and helping Nigerians to understand how one candidate is um, more important or more interesting or more qualified than others in a way that's non-partisan. Um, something that's come up repeatedly is that um, both the media it doesn't seem to be unbiased. How can we get unbiased voices to talk about these um, candidates in a way that is very objective and measurable? That will deal with voters' apathy, I think. Um, I won't talk about security issues, because Clement has covered that extensively. Um, and it was also good to hear from Jega that um, despite the security challenges, INEC has plans to have elections everywhere um, in 2015. That's very important. So in terms of recommendations, which is where I want to focus on, I think we have a very unique opportunity with these elections in terms of looking at things that haven't been done yet. In terms of improving the transparency around elections and um, collation, Jega has mentioned many important things like color coding of the, of the ballot papers. One other thing that we really should consider, and I'm sure it has its challenges, but how can we help, is to get our results res um, released polling unit by polling unit. Now, what will it take for that to happen? How many polling units do we have? And it's a bit troubling to hear that we're going to have more polling units. At the end of the day, we're not sure how many. But let me give a context of 2011 election and why for me it's so important to have results released polling unit by polling unit. I live in Abuja with my three siblings and we all live in different areas, so we were all in different polling units. And so we had the opportunity to do as INEC asked, which is stay there, wait until our vote was counted, and it was announced, and it was pasted. And the communication around this was very, very good. So I knew what the polling results were for my polling unit, and I went home and sat in front of the TV, happily waiting to see these results announced so that I would be able to verify that my polling unit results were correct. But unfortunately, the results for FCT were announced in a lump. I mean, what's the point of telling us to wait until our votes are counted and posted if we're not going to know at the end of the day that when it's collated, the results haven't changed between the polling units and the collation center? So for me, this is a very big deal with social media, Twitter, SMS, Nigeria is in a very ideal position to act as monitors, to be millions of extra eyes that are helping INEC to keep the um, results verifiable. And this is where maybe exit polls could come in. How can we use this to also help um, create some more transparency around the process? So for me, use of technology is very key. How can we get this into INEC planning? Um, in addition to that, I would like to say, my turn is not up. Do I still have two? Okay. <laughs> I want to just say very quickly that um, there's a lot to do in terms of curating knowledge, and I think that's where my own um, excitement about the 2015 elections is. 
um, how can we start harnessing what's going on even from now? Elections is pre-election, election and post-election. I think there's a lot to do in terms of creating more transparency, having websites that sort of track what's going on even from now. Um, there are lots of initiatives going on in Nigeria around CSOs, where can support come for them and the technology they want to use to ensure that we can all sort of use the same checklist um, as observers during the 2015 election so that all this information is very easily collated and can act as a result. So for example, um, it's not public information, but if I heard that 30% women were the voters in Gombe, how do I know if this is good or bad if I don't know what it was before? So it's very important to start keeping that type of data, um, and it helps with building our democracy and strengthening the elections that we're, that we're working towards. But that said, I want to say that INEC has definitely done a lot to improve. Um, their, um, their work is commendable, and also their burdens are, are understood. But the truth is Nigerians have been bruised by decades of bad elections, and just the unfortunate truth is we just have to do better. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Aisha. We love the policy recommendations as well. So uh, uh, finally, over to you, Festus. <coughs> you know, you know the, the beauty about speaking last is that uh, you can just adopt what every other person has said <laughs> and, uh, and either make some additions or just uh, keep quiet. Um, the, the, since this particular electoral commission uh, came into being, I think that there has been increased um, confidence on the part of the Nigerian people that there's a possibility that, that, that their votes may likely count if they vote. Now, with the release of the electoral timetable by the Independent National Electoral Commission uh, over the weekend, the political tempo and the dynamics of the Nigerian situation has just simply changed. Uh, there were some politicians who did not realize that the 2015 election was so close and that the political party primaries were so close. The release of the timetable has just jolted them, and most of them are rushing back to their constituencies. Now, as an individual, I look towards the 2015 elections with some, with some level of confidence. But getting towards the election itself and getting the Independent National Electoral Commission to conduct the election itself is, for me, as, at the moment, not the primary issue. The primary issue is that if you look at the narrative of the Nigerian situation on the part of the politicians, on the part of the political parties, you can see two tendencies that have just emerged. The first tendency that has emerged is that there are some who believe that Nigeria should rather disintegrate if they cannot win the elections and that everybody should go away. And that is what has informed some of the people who are either in support or opposed to the idea of the president organizing a national conference or organizing a national dialogue. There's also another tendency, and that tendency is towards the fact that, look, if we cannot win, anti-democratic forces can take over and let everybody go home. These are some of the two tendencies that have just emerged, and these are very, very uh, serious tendencies within the political process, and this tendency is what is defining what is going on in Nigeria now. now if you look at the political configuration, you can see that the ruling party and the opposition political party, the main opposition political party, have almost equal number of members in the, national, in the House of Representatives as of now. They have almost equal number of members in the Senate. They have almost equal number of governorship, uh, 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 governors in the, in the various states. And because of that, the ruling party believes that it can win, the opposition party believes that he can win the elections, and this is what is making the Nigerian people nervous, and this is what is heightening the political uh, tension in the country. Now, the implication of all this is that as at the moment Professor Atahiru Jega released the, the timetable for the elections, governor, governance more or less has ceased, and what we have now is just politics, politics and politics and nothing more. Therefore, the unfinished business of constitutional and electoral reform, which all of us are looking up to or looking forward to, may not likely happen. And there are two areas for me as, a, as, as, a, as an individual I was looking forward to uh, getting the National Assembly to amend the constitutional and electoral framework 
uh, for the conduct of the elections. The first is in relation to the conduct of political party primaries. Because for those of you who are familiar with the Nigerian law, Section 87 of the Electoral Act sets out in very clear detail what a political party must do in conducting its party primary elections and says that it is the candidate or the aspirant that wins the highest number of votes in a pa political party primary elections whose name should be submitted to the Independent National Electoral Commission as the candidate of the political party. But at the run-up to the 2011 elections, the National, the National Assembly went and added a proviso to Section 31 of the same electoral framework, saying that whatever you do in relation to your uh, uh, political party primaries, the moment the, the political party submits a name to the Independent National Electoral Commission, the Independent National Electoral Commission must accept that particular name as the candidate of the political party, thereby nullifying the provision, the, 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 uh, more or less the provisions of Section 87 of the Electoral Act. So I was hoping that that particular provision will be amended, but with politics in the air, the possibility of having that is very, very remote. The second area I was looking at relates to the conclusion of pre-election activities. The National Assembly amended the constitutional and electoral framework, giving a timeline within which election tribunals must con uh, conclude election petitions and the Court of Appeal must conclude a, a, a piece in relation to it and the Supreme Court must conclude. But in relation to pre-election matters, in relation to activity, um, issues relating to pa pol uh, political party pa primaries and so on and so forth, there's no time limit. Th that is why if you go to Nigerian courts, as of today, there are still matters arising from pre-election activities that are still pending in court. One was just resolved last week in relation to the governorship elections uh, in, in Imo State. So we are going to finish the 2015 elections and some of the pre-election matters arising from the 2011 elections will still be pending in court. So I thought that that is one area that we should have concluded uh, before politicking starts. The second area relates to the issue of the prosecution of electoral offenders. The chairman of the Independent National Electoral Commission has told the National Assembly that he wants to focus on organizing elections and not prosecuting electoral offenders, and that they should pass the Electoral Offenses Commission bill. Nobody is listening, because those who are there believe that um, if they have such a commission, it may, mo it may, it, it may cut both ways. So they, they, are, they are not interested, because they believe that there's a possibility that they may also get, engage in electoral malpractices and get away with it. The, the third area relates to the issue of insecurity uh, in, the, in, the, in the northeast and some parts of northern Nigeria, the southeast and south-south of Nigeria. Now, my worry is that the Electoral Commission uses members of the National Youth Service Corps to conduct elections in Nigeria. Now, in the three states where we have a state of emergency, that is uh, Adamawa State, Yobe State, and Bonu State, most of the people deployed to those places to do their national youth service redeploy to other states. So the implication is that very few parents will even agree for their sons and daughters to be engaged as ad hoc staff for the conduct of those elections. So there's a challenge in relation to getting even persons to agree to serve as, as ad hoc staff in, to, in some of those places. And also there's also a challenge in relation to the electoral framework because by the Nigerian constitution, for you to be declared as the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, or for you to win the elections, you must not only have the highest number of votes, you must also secure 25% uh, of the votes in two thirds of all the states of the federation. So, and whether you conduct elections in Yobe, Bonu, or Adamawa state, does not matter in calculating the two thirds you must also calculate them. So if we don't have elections in those three states, it's going to have an impact, a very serious impact, on the, uh, on the conduct of um, uh, the, the, uh, the Nigerian elections. So, so for me, as things are very, very fluid, 
what those of us in civil society need to do is to try and find ways and means of recreating ourselves. Uh, ourselves. The danger I see and my worry is that while civil society groups and organizations are trying to recreate themselves, the politicians and the political parties are busy floating and creating their own civil society groups and organizations. And their own civil society groups and organizations are more resourced and more powerful. They can place uh, uh, full page adverts on the newspapers. They can engage uh, uh, the radio stations. And they can also engage journalists to write stories for them. So people are finding it very difficult to determine which one is the genuine civil society group and which one is the government um, or, poli or political party or politicians uh, funded uh, uh, civil society. So I agree with Clement uh, that the international community must keep the pressure on the Nigerian state to make sure that one, that they don't engage in policies and programs that will lead to the disintegration of Nigeria or that will lead to anti-democratic forces taking over uh, uh, the reins of power uh, in, 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 in Nigeria. And I also think that we have to also find ways and means of supporting the electoral management body to conduct free, fair, and transparent uh, uh, elections. So far, we, uh, Professor Jagger and his team have done well in trying to show up the confidence of the Nigerian people on the electoral process and but the elections in Anambra State and the way the electoral management body handled it um, did not give that particular confidence on the Nigerian people that as we move towards 2015 elections, the elections will be better. So it is on that basis that those of us from civil society groups and organizations are still working with the electoral management body to re-engage the Nigerian people with the electoral process and reassure them that the problem in Anambra State was a one-off thing that may not likely repeat itself. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you to all three of you for such uh, uh, focused, uh, uh, great presentations. And uh, allows us uh, 20, 25 minutes or so for uh, questions and answers. So I'm going to open the floor straight away, uh, take a group of questions at a time. Uh, please identify yourself and keep the questions as to the point as possible so we can fit in as many as we can. Let's start with the gentleman at the back. He was the first in raising his hand. Yes, uh, I want to commend all our colleagues uh, who have spoken today. And uh, I especially thank uh, Professor Jagger for the creativity that he brings uh, to a long-running problem. My name is Emmanuel Ogebe. I'm with the US-Nigeria Law Group. And all of you were my colleagues when we were fighting for democracy. Uh, sadly, we're still outside the process, critiquing the process. When will we be in the process? Now, my question is this. Um, I am somewhat baffled by the fact that we've un discounted the loss of lives that occurred in 2011. As the monetization of the process is limited, we're now seeing a militarization of the process. And uh, we had youth coppers who were killed, including a friend of mine, in 2011. My question is this. What steps are being taken to ensure an end to um, electoral violence or post-election violence? Um, if the people who perpetrated violence have not been imprisoned, that means they're still around. And guess what? They're empowered to continue uh, in the next election. Uh, just last week, we heard what El Rufai said. He has predicted precisely that people are going to be killed uh, in next year's elections. What are we doing to mitigate the propensity for uh, violence? Thank you. Great, great question. Uh, let's take, uh, I'm peering around here. But let's take the question, uh, yes, exactly, right there. Uh, thank you very much. Lawrence Freeman from um, the Africa Desk EAR. I think the previous question is uh, very important to take in mind. If a thousand people were killed following the Zimbabwe election, I think there would have been a lot of people up in arms. Uh, so this is a very serious question. Will violence continue? My, my comments are to Festus. You mentioned that there are forces that are con would disintegrate Nigeria or would allow it to disintegrate if they don't win the election. I wonder if you could say more about that. Uh, my concern is given the continued horrible economic conditions in Nigeria that it's going to be very hard if leaders and political uh, candidates do not address these underlying questions, there could be some kind of response from the population. 
And uh, if this would be part of a policy where people revving up various groups against the government if they don't win the election, then I would like your comments on that. And uh, let's take the lady in the middle here as well. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Rosemary Seguero. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. I I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We observe elections. We observed elections in Kenya in 2013, as the chairman said, and um, we also we are also going to observe election in 20 uh, in May in South Africa, and also looking at uh, Nigeria. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we submitted our letter. I have the copies here of us being accredited, and uh, I wanted to know why does it take so long for us to be accredited? And when you are talking about funding, because without uh, accreditation, we cannot get funding. So I hope you will accredit our organization again. And looking at violence, involve the women and the youth who are the violence actors. Those women are the mothers of those children. Those young people need to be empowered. Give them leadership to be security in their own countries, in the stations, because they are the ones who bring violence. So if they are part of the leadership, they won't be to have time to bring violence. So look into that and uh, we hope and for the best for Nigeria and we hope and look forward for doing election observation. I come from Kenya anyway. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Well, let, let's, let's respond to those questions because they're all, they're all around the theme of, of violence and, and what can be done to pre present it, what are the, uh, prevent it and what are the risks. Um, I'd encourage our other three um, members of the delegation to chip in with any comments as well. So if you have anything, just a gesture. Um, Festus, do you, want, do you want to go first as the part of the question was directed to you about the forces of in disintegration in, in Nigeria? Uh, well, uh, um, uh, let, let, me, let me just uh, deal with the issue of uh, 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 electoral violence. Uh, when the chairman of the electoral management body was speaking, he did give you an idea of the number of um, electoral offenders that have been prosecuted in Nigeria arising from the 2011 elections. Now, there are very serious challenges relating to prosecuting people who commit electoral um, uh, uh, offenses. The first is that, one, the electoral management body does not have the requisite uh, number of personnel uh, to prosecute electoral offenses all over, all over Nigeria. Uh, sec secondly, the police officers or security agencies that are on election duty, sometimes they don't carry out on el election, election duty in the states where they are ordinarily uh, posted to. On election day, some of them are moved from one place to the other. So when they arrest an electoral offender, for instance, on election day, they finish the elections and they go back to their base. When it is time to charge the electoral offender to court or to give evidence, it is also always very, very difficult uh, to get them to come and give evidence. And that is why you have a situation where if you look at the statistics of even those who were charged to court arising from electoral offenses, you will see that most of the cases were thrown out on grounds of uh, a lack of um, a diligence in prosecution because um, the prosecutors could not get the police officers or those who made the arrest to come and give evidence in court. So the cases had to be thrown out. The other thing is that the, some of the people who are arrested on election day are just the foot soldiers of the actual people who send them. The executive offenders are never arrested because they just send out some young people to go and commit some of the, these electoral offenses and they simply go away. And if, for instance, I send people to go and commit an electoral offense and most of them are arrested and then I win the governorship elections, the first thing I will do is to ask my attorney general to go and enter a nole and free all of them. So it is based on that that we are saying that we need a separate uh, um, um, electoral offenses uh, commission to deal with electoral of, uh, offenses and electoral offenders. But the National Assembly is shying away uh, from even touching it. Unfortunately, um, I was a member of the Electoral Reform Committee, and Professor Jega was also a member of the Electoral Reform uh, Committee in Nigeria. During the process of our work, there was um, a, a, an inter-political parties uh, consultative committee that was set up by the then President Yaradua um, to also look at the issue of 
elect electoral reforms. And the vice president then, who is the current president of Nigeria, uh, headed that particular uh, um, uh, consultative committee. They were the ones who drew up the Electoral Offenses Commission bill and forwarded to the Electoral uh, um, Reform Committee. What we did was just to clean up what the current president drew up and then uh, uh, forward it back to them. I'm de definitely surprised that since he came to power, he's no longer talking about a bill which he drafted. <laughs> and the National Assembly are also no, no longer talking about it. So everybody is keeping moot on it. So I believe that we need an Electoral Offenses Commission uh, um, uh, uh, tribunal uh, to deal with the issue of uh, electoral offenses. On the issue of uh, the forces of disintegration, if you've been reading the, the, the newspapers, there, there's, there's, there are some people who believe that the current president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria is facing electoral challenges because he's from the Niger Delta. And that since we have oil in the Niger Delta and he's facing all these challenges, that anybody who, who wants to prevent him from contesting the elections or seeking re-election is an enemy. In fact, if you've been reading the newspapers, uh, one of the prominent leaders of the Niger Delta, Delta came out in the open and said that anybody who is opposing uh, the president's re-election is opposing God. <laughs> you know, so, so, and there are some forces who have been saying, if the president does not win this election, Nigeria can go to blazes. And nobody is talking to them, nobody is saying, say, say, saying anything to them. So, so, so for, and, and the president, he has all these things and he keeps quiet. He has never for one day come out to say, no, Nigeria as an entity has come to, be, uh, has come to stay. Nigeria is an entity, uh, it's a sovereign state, and I will not encourage anybody that will um, tamper with his sovereignty. He has never come, come out to say that. So what that means is that he is also giving some tacit approval and tacit encouragement to some of these people who are saying these things. And then there are those on the other side who are saying, um, this is our chance to win. And if we cannot win, then we don't care who takes over. And when you say if you cannot win, you don't care who takes over, we know who you want to take over. So, so I think that all these things, coupled with some of the economic challenges we have and some of the security uh, challenges we have in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the Northeast and some parts of the, of, of the North, uh, is making people uh, not to have confidence going towards the 2015 elections. But I think that with the way things are going, if civil society engages this process, if the electoral management body gives the Nigerian people confidence, and if the international community engages this process and says, look, um, we are focusing on Nigeria, we don't want anything to happen uh, to the uh, sovereignty of the country, I think that uh, some of the forces that are calling for disintegration and some of the forces that are saying that um, anti-democratic forces can uh, we take over, we be very, very careful in what they do and what they say. Um, I just want to add about the violence. D definitely there's a level of impunity, which again goes way back. Um, but I think there are many things that we can do because it's not likely we're going to get an election. Um, what's the, what do you call this? Election? Yeah, yeah, the Exactly, before now in 2015. So what can we do? I know that the National Human Rights Commission is preparing a very extensive report on election malpractice and it's due to be released anytime soon. I think it's something that all um, Africa watchers should be looking out for because it's going to name some people. I think there's an opportunity here to use the media. We've talked about the use of the media. Can INEC use the media to um, focus on these 800,000 people that we hear on the list. Who are they? What are their names? Are they on the electoral register? Can they be punished in some other way? We have to think creatively because, as I said, we can't rely on just um, having an electoral offenses commission, which will probably take a few years to do. Again, there's a way to use um, youth groups, women groups. Um, some, one speaker mentioned the fact that women are the ones who can talk to the young people who are their children. Maybe these are the opportunities that we need between now and the 2015 elections to highlight the importance of not getting involved in violent acts. Um, we just have to think about ways around the issues. So I really think INECTO has a role to play. Who are these 800,000 people who committed offenses? Can, they, can their names be published? What are, what, are the rules that, what, what are the rules that talk about privacy that would not allow them to do this? but how can we use what tools we already have instead of waiting for something that we don't have? Thanks. 
Um, Abiola, one of our other delegates, has, has some comments. Thank you very much. Um, one, one of the things that I want to say, uh, particularly uh, relating to the issue of electoral violence, um, I think that one of the biggest challenge that we have as Nigerians is how do we change the narrative? What do we have in the space now? Everybody's talking about the politics so heated up that everybody's talking about violence. So it is one of the challenges that we have to address as civil society. How do we begin to turn that discussion around to something that is, will be much more beneficial to the Nigerian people? And I think that with that, we'll be able to begin to see how we can address the issue of violence in the election. Uh, I participated in the monitoring of the election in a number of states. And uh, I'm aware that uh, IFES uh, put in a lot of money in working around the National Association for Peaceful Election. And one of the things that they were doing was to look at uh, uh, early warning signs around elections. And uh, I participated uh, in one of the programs that they organized with INEC uh, in a number of states where they had to go to all the local government. And they used beyond the traditional method of passing messages to people. They used town criers. Crier, they spoke with people in town hall to ensure that um, the election does not come with violence. And um, we also went to the extent of training civil society organizations about identifying early warning signs. There was a website where information was being posted about uh, uh, manifestation of violence uh, in the election. And I think that going by that, I think it's very important to talk about uh, support for civil society. Uh, to be able to strengthen our work around uh, preventing uh, election violence from the three, uh, from the uh, electoral cycle, from the pre to the during and also to post election to ensure that we monitor and um, bring out some of the uh, early warning signs. And the other thing about changing the narrative is also that it's important for us to be begin to affirm election as an accountability tool in Nigeria. And I think that that's what we have not done for a long time. We have people who are politicians who lack no ideology today. They are in one political party. Tomorrow, they are in another one. And of course, they are ready to go to the third, to fourth, fifth. And it keeps going like that, meaning that you are even there in politics for no reason. So our politics in Nigeria cannot be business as usual. And I think that that is where the civil society can also make uh, a very strong intervention to ensure that we begin to change the, the face of politics to an issue-based politics. Then also to change uh, the face of election in such a way that people will believe in mandate protection. So every Nigeria, you know that you have to protect your vote and we work towards it. And, I, and that's why I will support what uh, Clement said earlier on, that there is a need for a lot of support. We are not starting early, I must say. Uh, the election is February, that's, that's less than one year. So we need, to, we need all the support that we need to take to be able to go uh, the right way in 2015 elections. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and and uh, yes, you have uh, some comments as well from another of our, our, uh, our delegates, please. Yeah, uh, just a little bit on the issue of electoral violence, which is actually at the center of the core challenges we have in Nigeria. And uh, I want to emphasize the fact that people are not going to stop being violent because some people talk to them. Violence is going to stop when Nigeria begins to punish violence. You know, that has to be made very clear. I've not seen any jurisdiction anywhere in the world where people stopped violence because it was fashionable. Somebody has got to be punished for committing an offense. And if you look at it critically from what has been said by my colleagues, you will see that for the fact that a sitting president who was part of configuring an electoral violence commission bill does not want to talk about the bill anymore. You will agree with me that they are configuring an arrangement for violence to happen. Because I don't know what other thing you would do rather than push the bill you prepared while you were outside the political space. When you have all the power now to make sure that this bill is passed in one month. And I can assure you, because of the contentions at the moment, where both the opposition and the ruling party are having a 50-50 thing, which is healthy for Nigeria, I must confess, passing that bill will receive bipartisan alliance. Because at the moment, there is the tension on both sides, as uh, Fabian noted, um, Festus noted. So that, that bill is a bill we need to talk about now. You know, despite the politicking going on, it is becoming clear to everybody that violence might mar that election. And there is need for an elite consensus on addressing violence as a first step towards this election. 
And I think that is what the international community need to push with us. That it's not just going to be an issue of persuading people. Nigeria can pass bills in 48 hours if they want to. This Electoral Offenses Commission bill can be passed and put to force before this election. And I can assure you that if we don't do that, just take it that some people are configuring this election for violence. That is one. And then um, on, on the issue of voter register, which is core to what we're doing, and I thank Professor Jiga for being very proactive on that, because that's one of the things that will trigger the intra-election violence in 2015 if it is not addressed. We're all in Anambra, you know, as he noted, and um, there were clearly people who couldn't vote because their names weren't on the register. They, they don't understand your, your electronic, biometric, and all of those uh, highfalutin words. The only issue is that they got somewhere and registered in 2011 and voted, and in, 20, in 2013, they went there and they were told they can't vote. So there is a fundamental issue with that register. And I think there is need for the international community to support the commission. Of course, we are all, uh, all of us in, in the civil society are willing to support the commission to make sure that we have a credible voter register before the 2015 election. And that means that the work on that register will start like yesterday. It is something of high national priority and demands an emergency attention. Because even though INEC compiles the register, the voter register is a public document that should belong to the people of Nigeria. So the idea is that moving out of this session today, whatever can be done should be done for us in the next six months to have a register that Nigerian citizens can relate with, that a woman who sells gari in the market, or gari is a cassava product anyway, <laughs> knows, where, knows, where, knows six months in advance where she's going to vote in 2015, and understand to a very reasonable extent the logistics that will follow her to make her she votes. You know, if we don't take care of that, some of the intra-election violence as did happen in Kenya, I hope our sister will share the experience with us on how they got across that bridge, you know, may also occur here. So that is very important. And then just a little one on the electoral day staff, because INEC has got its permanent staff who are all working with the chair, as noted, we believe in the chair, but we don't seem to believe in most of the other guys there. Yeah, why we are hoping that we'll believe with them as we move on and the system get better. Now, those ones are the core staff. But on election day, a lot more people are engaged whose actions and inactions impact heavily on the election. They call them ad hoc staff, which is a word I think we may also drop from now moving forward. Because they actually are very ad hoc. Their knowledge may be ad hoc in most cases, and everything about them is ad hoc, you know, uh, including being part of post-election things, you may not find some of them again. Because um, they, 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 they before now come from different quarters, of course, with the NYAC. If your service does finish in that state before the electoral issues are concluded, you may not even be around to give evidence. So but moving from here, it is important to make those people to know that they are not just ad hoc. They are election day staff. And they must be trained sustainably to be able to do the job. Because even the training protocol before now has been ad hoc, ad hoc which might not be unconnected with the funding of INEC, which we hope will improve if INEC does open up to say what they want in terms of funding. So arranging for the election day staff to be properly trained on what their duties are, and as my brother noted, to have them also get committed to some legal instruments that will make them accountable for whatever they do within the election would be a good way to stop all of these intra-election processes that mess up our election and generate a lot of violence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Jude. Now, I'm aware we've uh, already ran way over time, but uh, I just want to wrap things up and uh, with, with just one final question. Perhaps, uh, Clement, uh, uh, you can you can answer it. Um, it seems that we, we've been talking a lot, or people have been offering, uh, uh, asking questions or offering advice on what could the US can best provide in terms of support going into this election period. Um, obviously, there's, there's budgetary and technical assistance, but it seems one of the messages coming through, particularly on this violent, uh, issue of violence, is diplomatic uh, support in terms of speaking out, holding the government, political parties, and, and politicians to account. Would, 
what, what would your response be, uh, Clement, just to wrap things up in terms of what you would like to see most of all from the US and perhaps what you wouldn't like to see from the US in terms of support uh, in the next 12 months? Well, I think you've given my answer, actually. Uh, basically, we need diplomatic support. We need the message that is coming out from Nigeria in terms of advocacy by civil society groups taking up here in, in Washington and, and in London. Uh, I think it's important that in the meetings between US officials and Nigerian government officials, it is stated quite clearly what the expectations are of a free and fair elections and the government's uh, uh, responsibility to respect uh, the independence of the Electoral Commission and provide a conducive atmosphere for the conduct of free and fair elections in Nigeria. Thank you very much. And just because uh, we haven't heard from Enemo yet as the sixth member of our delegation, he just wants to say uh, something briefly as well. And so I'll let him have the final uh, word. And a microphone is just coming uh, uh, his way now. Imminently. <laughs> Please stand up so everyone can see you. Thank you. Um, just a few words on how we can uh, mitigate electoral violence in Nigeria. Um, as we've heard from everyone here, there is the likelihood of uh, violence uh, come 2015. And I think, and this is from a civil society perspective, that one, there is need for uh, us as a people especially the relevant agencies, to curb the inflammatory utterances of some of the politicians. Um, it's getting too hard. People are saying things and they've not been stopped and they've not been discouraged. I think something should be done about curbing the very, very violent and inflammatory uh, statements by some politicians. Secondly, I think that some of our journalists, uh, they should undergo some sort of conflict sensitive training. There is need for them to do that. Um, because again, that is contributing to the very volatile and heated uh, political uh, debates that's ongoing in the country. So there's something journalists can do. There's something in the way that they present the issues uh, that can definitely help contribute to a more serene environment for political debate to take place leading up to the elections. Finally, I think that uh, there should be sustained voters' education. And this is the time to do it. Civil society, all of us here, have a responsibility to ensure that leading up to the elections, we go to the communities, engage the people in the communities, talk to the youths, talk to the mothers, the children, the youths who carry out these activities, they have mothers. Talk to them. Try and sensitize Nigerians on the need for our youth not to die for a politician. It is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a good note to uh, end this morning's session. It's been a great conversation. We've covered a, a, a huge amount of ground, and we're going to have an opportunity in future sessions to delve in more detail into uh, some of the subsections that are wrapped up in, in this election. But please join me uh, in thanking uh, Professor Jago and all the rest of our delegates this morning for a great conversation. <laughs>